Yes, Roma wines taste better because only Roma selects from the world's greatest wine reserves for your pleasure. And now, Roma Wines, R-O-M-A, Roma Wines, present Suspense. Tonight, Roma Wines bring you Chester Morris as star of The Strange Death of Gordon Fitzroy, a suspense play produced, edited, and directed for Roma Wines by William Spear. Suspense. Radio's outstanding theater of thrills is presented for your enjoyment by Roma Wines. That's R-O-M-A. Roma Wines. Those better-tasting California wines Enjoyed by more Americans than any other wine. For friendly entertaining, for delightful dining. Yes, right now, a glass full would be very pleasant as Roma Wines bring you Chester Morris in a remarkable tale of... Suspense! I saw it once, in a mirror, in the police emergency hospital. I never saw it again. When they set me up, I smashed the mirror in my cell the first day. They never dared to put in another. The chaplain came and tried to talk to me about it a few times, and then a prison medic. But I turned over in my bunk and didn't answer. After a while, they stopped coming. Three and a half years. Almost every night I'd dream it wasn't like that, and wake up crying I was so happy, and then put up my hand in the dark to feel and I know that it was. It would always be. Three and a half years. Waiting and hating. Waiting to get out and hating one guy in particular and everybody in general. Waiting and hating. It was a cold, windy day in November, the day I left. The guard opened the gate and gave me the usual corny send-off. Well, Mr. Malone, I hope you enjoyed your stay here. <laughs> Call us up, make a reservation any time. I went on through and didn't answer it. I didn't even look at it. For three and a half years, I hadn't looked at anybody. I didn't want anybody looking at me, and I didn't look at anybody else. My coat collar was pulled up and my hat pulled down, and I walked towards the river to the little park there and hung around waiting for it to get dark. I knew what I was doing, all right. I was going to kill a man. But first, I was waiting for it to get dark. When it was, I went up into town and caught a train for New York that got me into Grand Central about 8.15. In the station, I went to a phone booth and called Sam Braggon. Then I went down there. Sam lived in a walk-up off Hudson Street, a good dark street. Dark hallway, too. Dark stairs. The third floor. Dark. Uh, who is it? Hello, Sam. Johnny. Oh, Johnny, you old son of a gun, you. Hello, Sam. Well, what are you standing there for? Come on in, come on. Wait, wait let me turn on the light. No. Uh, all right, Maybe Sam. You might as well see it now as later. Oh, Johnny. Johnny! I shouldn't have hit him, but I couldn't stop myself when I saw that look of horror and pity that I knew I'd always see from now on when anybody saw my face. My awful, scarred, twisted nightmare of a face. My face. I closed the door and got Sam into the front room and onto the couch. And then I got the phone and called Fran's old number because I couldn't stop myself from that either. Hello? Uh, is Miss Thompson there, Miss Frances Thompson? No, she ain't. Well, uh, is her mother there? No, they've gone away. Do you know where I can get in touch with her? No, I don't. Well, uh, do you know if they're coming back sometime? I hadn't expected anything different. I don't know why it should have made me so mad. When I turned around, Sam was just beginning to come out of it over on the couch. Oh. Oh, you. Yeah. Remember? 
You had no call to do that, Johnny. I know. I'm sorry. You ought to be. I said I'm sorry. I, uh... I guess I've been so long where I wanted to and couldn't that I took out the whole three and a half years on the first guy I could. I... I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry, too, Johnny. You want to talk about it? Turn out the lights, Sam. Sure. Okay. Thanks. Where's Fran? Fran? You remember Fran. Oh, yeah, yeah. You and her... Well, where is she? Gee, Johnny, I don't oh, know. Don't kid me. She's with Gordy Fitzroy, isn't she? Isn't she? I swear, Johnny, I swear I don't know what Fran's been doing. I ain't heard nothing of Fran for a couple of years. All right. All right, I'll find out. Didn't she come to see you up there? Yeah. Yeah, at first she did. But I didn't see her. They got lights on you when you see people up there, Sam. I only want to see Fran in the dark. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Where's Gordy Fitzroy? I don't know, Johnny. He's, uh, he's still around, isn't he? Oh, sure, sure. I hear he's got another place uptown. Huh? Yeah, I bet. What's the angle, Johnny? You sure you didn't hear nothing? To tell you the truth, Johnny, it was so long since you was in touch, I, uh... I heard you got a three to five, and that's about all. Okay. I'll tell you the rest. Is it how that happened? Yeah, it's how that happened. You remember the gang around here in the old days? You, Sam, Gordy Fitzroy, and Fran and me that always ran together when we were kids. And then Fran went to City College, and I got into a little trouble. And Gordy inherited that jewelry store from his uncle. Do you remember all that? Oh, sure, I remember. You were all good kids. Yeah, well... It was about a year after the last time I saw you. Gordy was having trouble. He owed a lot of dough to the bookies and had to hock his jewelry store to pay off. And then he had a bright idea. Uh, Georgia did? Yeah. He had about ten or fifteen grand worth of assorted rocks in his safe at the store. We were going to crack it and peddle the rocks and collect the insurance, too, and split. Fifty-fifty. Yeah? I was going to do the job, but I made him come with me. And, of course, we had to blow the safe to make it look right. Yeah, yeah, sure. Well, something went wrong. I used too much soup or something, and and it blew in my face. In my face. Oh, so that's how. Yeah. Only that wasn't all. When I came out of it, Gordy was still there, but he'd ratted on me to save his own skin. There were cops all over the place, and Gordy was telling them how he'd caught me in the act of blowing his safe and knocked me cold or something. And the cops couldn't make up their minds between patting him on the back and kicking me in the belly. We are doing plenty of both. Oh, he was quite a little hero there, Gordy was. Gee, Johnny. He, he did that? He did better than that. He even testified at my trial. Even Fran believed him, I guess. She said she didn't, but I don't know. So I I got three to five and lucky that. I was all bandages then. I I didn't know how bad it really was till after the trial. And then then they took him off. I only saw it once, Sam. I never dared look at it again. Oh, gee. What do you what are you going to do, Johnny? What do you think? Yeah, but look. Look, that's bad, Johnny. Why, they'd they pin it on you before you got off at the subway. Mm -hmm. Not the way I'm going to do it. You got a way to do it? Yeah. I got a way. For suspense, Roma Wines are bringing you Chester Morris. In the strange death of Gordon Fitzroy, Roma Wine's presentation tonight in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Between the acts of Suspense, this is Ken Niles for Roma Wines. Today was a memorable Thanksgiving. And here's a tip on how to give tempting first meal flavor to your Thanksgiving dinner leftovers. Serve those leftovers with delicious Roma California wine. 
for both robust Roma Burgundy and glorious Roma Sauterne have tantalizing taste harmonies with food that bring out all the subtle hidden flavors in any meat or fowl, hot or cold. Yes, better tasting Roma wines make simple turkey hash and epicures delight. And Roma wines do taste better. For Roma starts with California's choicest grapes. Roma skill and America's finest winemaking resources guide this great treasure to tempting taste perfection. Then Roma selects at peak taste richness from the world's greatest wine reserves for your pleasure. And here's a holiday tip. Take advantage of present low Roma prices. Tomorrow, buy Roma by the case and save. That's R-O-M-A. Roma, America's favorite wine. And now, Roma Wines bring back to our Hollywood soundstage Chester Morris as Johnny Malone in The Strange Death of Gordon Fitzroy, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. Sam was always a good G. He let me shack up there and he helped me out. He found out where Gordy Fitzroy lived, alone in a little house on Long Island, and how he always caught the same train that got him out there about 10.30 every night. He made the contact with the guy that was going to fix me up the package, too. It was about a week later that I went around to collect it. It was a little basement watch repair shop off Avenue C. At least, that was the guy's front. He was a dried-up little guy with thick glasses, and he was working over some kind of a clock. Yeah? You want something? I'm Pete Jones. Pete Jones? Yeah. You got something for me, haven't you? I don't know. I'd have to look. Sam Braggin sent me. I don't know no Sam Braggin. I don't go by names in here. Yeah, well, what do you go by? I just remember. Well, start remembering. Let me take a look at you. I said I'm Pete Jones. Okay. I guess you're the guy. Where do I put up the sign? What sign? We got to go on back. I don't want no one coming in while we're gone. Come on. Where is it? You're looking at it. That suitcase. I'll open it up. I want to see it. That suitcase ain't made to be opened up no more, bud. Okay. How do you work it? You see the slide and that snap lock? Yeah. You push it just once. When you do that, it's time to blow in three hours. What'll it do? Like the atom bomb, bud. Like the atom bomb. Listen, you ain't mixed up in any kind of politics, are you? Like that Christian front gang or anything? No. Because I don't do that kind of work. Dangerous. This is strictly business. Personal. Okay. You know what this job is going to cost you? One C was what I was told. No. Two C's. Is that the way you always do business? Materials are going up. Well, I'll give you one and a half and a working over. Now, what'll it be? I'll take the one and a half. Three hours, you said. Yeah, three hours. Now, here's your dough. And this thing better work right. If it don't give satisfaction, wise guy, bring it back. Three hours would give me plenty of time. I went out to Gordy Fitzroy's house in Long Island the next night, about 9.30, an hour before he'd get home. The place was dark like it should have been. I went around back where there was a kitchen window. I jimmied it and stepped inside with my suitcase full of trouble. For a minute, I stood and listened and almost thought I heard something. (laughs) Nerves, I guess. Imagination. Upstairs, under his bed, would be the best place. But first, I wanted to set it. I put my flash on the slide lock and pushed it like the guy had said. But it wouldn't move. I tried again, and it moved the wrong way. (laughs) It must have got pushed by mistake earlier sometime, and then... I heard the buzzing sound it was making. I gave a wild look around and saw a space behind the stove and threw it in there and started for the window. I was about halfway out when I felt the blast and something hit me in the face and that was all I... (laughs) 
It was funny, but I came to sitting in a chair. Just sitting there, in a room I'd never seen before. It was dark, just a little light coming in from the street. And then I looked around a little and saw the bed. I knew it must be a hospital. And I remembered. But it, it couldn't have been too bad. They, they couldn't have to operate or I'd be in bed and feeling sick. But there I was, just sitting in one of those hospital nightshirts and bathrobes. Just sitting. And then the door opened. A doctor and a nurse. I could draw him a shock. I just have to keep trying, that's all. Well, how's the patient this evening? Don't turn on the lights, Doc. Well, oh, what's that you said? I said don't turn on the lights. I like it better in the dark. How did you know I was your doctor? I guessed. You are, aren't you? Oh, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. How am I? You, uh, you, you, you seem to be fine now. The, uh, the bulls outside? The who? Coppers, police. Oh, the police. I, uh, they were here, but, uh, they're not around anymore. <laughs> they got tired, huh? Yes, I guess they did. Thanks for telling me. Well, it's nice to see you feeling so well. I'll drop by in the morning. We'll have a long talk. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, sure, in the morning. There were socks and shirts in the bureau. There were shoes and a suit and a hat and overcoat in the closet. They weren't mine, but what did I care? Because the cops must have quit watching me for the night, and that meant I could break out of here. There was no time for any fancy suitcase jobs now. If I was going to get Gordy Fitzroy before the cops got me, I had to go after him and give it to him, face to face. I put on the duds and got out into the hall and down a back stairway and out through the basement without anybody even seeing me. I knew where I could get a gun, and I got it. And then... Then all of a sudden, I was thinking about Fran. I knew I was washed up. I knew they'd get me for what I was going to do to Gordy, but... But before that, I wanted to see her. I just wanted to see her. I took a chance that the old dame on the phone might have been brushing me off the other night, and I went to a booth and dialed the number. Hello? Fran? Yes? Who's this? Fran. It's... It's Johnny. Johnny Malone. Johnny? Oh, Johnny. Yeah. Yeah, me too. Are you... Out? Yeah. Fran, I... I want to see you. I want to see you the worst way, but... But what, Johnny? Did you know what happened? Yes, Johnny, I know. No. No, I mean all of it. Uh, how bad it was? Yes, the warden told me. He even showed me pictures. He did? Did you get my letters? Yeah, I got them. But I tore them up. Why? Because I didn't want to know what was in them, maybe. Because I didn't want to even think about you. After what happened. And then, then they stopped coming. Well, I joined the Red Cross. I've been away for two years. Oh. You, you sure you want to see me, Fran? Of course I do. Listen, Johnny, I'll meet you now at, at Jack's, the old place. No. No, it, it, it's too bright there, Fran. Too much light. Oh, all right, where? Uh... Down on your corner, Hudson Street. Ten minutes. All right, Johnny. I'll be there. I waited in the shadows in the doorway. My heart seemed to be going crazy and I could hardly breathe. I forgot all about Gordy Fitzroy and what I was going to do. I, I didn't even care anymore. Maybe something could be worked out. Maybe Fran and I could somehow... And then I heard her coming down the street. I looked. It was her, all right. I was scared now. I just waited where I was, trying to get my breath. She got to the corner and looked around. And then she stood there for a minute under the street light. And I walked up and went up behind her. I laid my hand on her arm. That's all. Just laid my hand on her arm. And she whirled around and looked at me. Full in the face. Did <gasps> we? Get away from me. Get away. Get away. Get away. I ran. I just ran. I was so torn up inside, I didn't know what I felt. 
there were tears dripping out of my twisted eye sockets. And then, then I stopped. It's all right. She lied to me. She didn't know what had happened, and she didn't care. And when she saw it, she was like all the rest. No, right? And if she could dish it out that way, she could take it that way. But I wasn't going to leave her behind, either. I went around the block and back to her house. I went up the steps and into the vestibule. It was dark in there. Good and dark. I waited. It was nearly half an hour before I heard her coming up the steps. Hello, friend. Johnny. Oh, Johnny, why are you hiding here in the dark? Why did you do it? I waited and waited and you never even showed up and I was... Cut it out. You had your chance, friend. And now it's... This. <laughs> I ran out on the street, through the valley to the courtyard, the building next door, and over the fence and through another alley. I was on the next street. There was a cab coming, and I hailed him. Where to, Mr. Just drive uptown. I'll tell you where later. Okay. The next on the list was Gordon Fitzroy. There was no use calling the house on Long Island. I know I'd blown that sky high. But I had to find him before morning. I... I tried to think. There must be somebody who'd know where he was. Uh, staying in town now, probably. A cabbie. Sure, one of the cabbies up around where his store was ought to know. I tapped on the glass behind the driver. He slid it back without looking around. You know where you want to go now? Um, listen, is, uh, is there a cab stand up around 53rd and Lex? There sure is. Well, that's where I want to go. Okay, you're taking me right home. Yeah. That's your stand? Sure. I just happened to get a fare down here tonight. Well, then maybe you're just the guy I want to talk to. Me? About what? There's a, there's a jewelry store up around there named Fitzroy's. Yeah, that's right. Gordon Fitzroy. Yeah, an old pal of mine. You know him? Yeah. I've drove him a few times. You don't know where I can get hold of him, do you? I mean, where he's living now? No, I don't, bud. Tell you the truth, I ain't seen him around lately. I think his partner runs the business mostly now. Oh, he's got a partner, huh? Oh, yeah. Know his name? Uh, let me see. No, it's, uh, it's right on a store there. Uh, begins with a Z. Uh, uh, Zellman. That's it, Zellman. Uh, first name Fred, I think. Well, you can stop right here. I want to make a phone call. Wait for me. Okay. Uh, Mr. Zellman? Yeah? Well, I'm sorry to bother you this time of night, Mr. Zellman, but uh, I'm an old pal of Gordon Fitzroy. I've been trying to find him, but his house in Long Island doesn't answer. Yeah, I guess it doesn't. Could you tell me where he is? Why, well, uh, he's had an accident. An accident? Uh-huh. He's in the hospital. Oh, gee, that's too bad. I, I'd like to see him, though. Uh, what hospital is he in? Why, well, uh... The Jefferson Hospital, room 508. The Jefferson Hospital. Thanks. The Jefferson Hospital. I I got it now. But that was the hospital I'd been in. I was almost sure. So Gordy had been in his house when I blew it. And they'd taken us both there. <laughs> Why else would he have had an accident just the same time as me? Maybe he was right on the same floor all the time. Maybe right in the next room to mine. Just so he was still alive, that's all. Because now I wanted to give it to him face to face. Jefferson Hospital was way out in Long Island, and I knew I wouldn't be able to pay the fare, but that didn't worry me. When we got there, I just stepped out of the cab with a gun in my hand. You want me to wait? No. No, beat it. What about me fare, Dick? This is your fare. What is this, a stick? Hey! You're, you're, you're... It's nothing. I'm nobody. Now beat it. It's the same place, all right. I got in through the basement just like I'd got out. 
I went up the same stairs. I, I remember now, five flights. The same floor. Only this time, there was an old dame, a nurse, sitting there at the desk. I had my gun out and down at my side before I even spoke to her. Well, where did you come from? I want to see the guy in 508. I'm sorry, but visiting hours... I know all about that. Take me to 508. <gasps> you wouldn't. Yes, I would, sister. Now get moving. We went down the hall. At 508, she stopped. But I poked her with a rod. Oh, please don't. She opened the door ahead of me. It was a room just like mine, but it was dark. Just a little street light coming in the window. Oh, please don't. I made her move inside. And then I slugged her. I looked around. I couldn't see much yet, but the bed was empty. I moved on into the room. And then I saw him. Standing in a door. But somebody must have tipped him off. He was... He was dressed. He... He had a gun in his hand. I fired, but nothing happened. It was glass, glass. Somebody had snapped on the lights. I whirled around, looking for him, and then I saw him. But in a mirror, it was me. Me with his face. His face. They must have come up behind me. I, I didn't even remember. I was in bed and half doped, and the room was full of medics and cops, but I knew. Gordy and me had both been in that house. Only the way he got it, they couldn't even find him. Only me. And they thought I was Gordy. And they fixed up my face from pictures the way they do to make me look like Gordy. And Fran had believed me. That's why she screamed at me. Because she thought I was Gordy, and she knew what he'd done to me. Oh, I knew. I knew, all right. Without even hearing them talking in their low voices, there beside my bed, and then apparently, I knew. Apparently the shock, the explosion and all was just too much for him. Yes, he was here for 21 months while we rebuilt his face. And you know, he never spoke a word until today. Well, he's due for another shock now. He's wanted for murder. I never even told them who I really was. What was the use? Suspense. Presented by Roma Wines, R-O-M-A, Roma, America's favorite wines. This is Ken Niles bringing back to our suspense microphone the star of the evening, Chester Morris. Uh, tell me, Chester, after so convincing a performance as a first-rate heel, don't you find it difficult to resume being the really nice guy we know you are? Oh, not at all, Ken. You know, I just whisper, abracadabra. And the villain in me disappeared. <laughs> well, I might have known, since you're one of Hollywood's most accomplished amateur magicians. Thank you. Uh, would you make me disappear if I asked how's tricks? Oh, now, Ken, I'd like to, but I don't know any tricks that good. <laughs> well, Chester, here's a trick you ought to know. What's that? It's a trick in taste magic. And the only props you need are glasses and delicious Roma California sherry. Then, when guests drop in, you simply pour, and presto, hospitality reigns. Well, that's a trick anyone can master, Ken, with Roma Sherry. Right, Chester, for Roma Sherry is the keynote of gracious entertaining, the popular first call for dinner. That's because Roma Sherry is better tasting. In fact, all Roma wines taste better, because Roma starts with choicest grapes, skillfully and unhurriedly guiding this grape treasure with America's finest winemaking resources to tempting taste perfection. Then, at the moment of peak taste richness, Roma selects from the world's greatest wine reserves for your pleasure. No wonder more Americans enjoy Roma than any other wine. Well, you're right, Ken. No wonder. And Chester, so you may practice this taste magic at home and delight your guests, here from Roma is a gift basket of Roma wine. Well, thank you, Ken, and thanks to Roma. And now, before I return to my top hats and rabbits, Ken, who will I be hearing on suspense this time next week? You'll be hearing Robert Taylor. Next week is sort of anniversary show for us. Roma will be beginning its fourth year of presenting suspense. It was Cary Grant who was our first star, and each year on our anniversary, Cary has appeared. This year, however, he'll be away from town. <clears throat> we'll present him later. Next week, it'll be Bob Taylor. Wonderful. And what kind of a story will Bob do, Ken? Well, it'll be a suspense play that involves him in a Christmas story with some of the eeriest and most inexplicable twists imaginable. 
It'll take all the magician in you to explain it away. <laughs> well, I'll certainly be listening. Chester Morris will soon be seen in the Columbia picture Inside Story. Tonight's suspense play was written by Bruce Cassidy and Robert L. Richards. Next Thursday, same time, you will hear Mr. Robert Taylor as star of Suspense. Produced and directed by William Spear for the Roma Wine Company of Fresno, California. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.